Hey guys, what's going on? It's Don here from Nova Spirit Tech and two things we got to take care of today. One, we're going to be taking a look at this amazing board called the Udu X86. And two, we're going to turn this little guy into a little home lab virtual machine server. So let's get started. So I've been wanting to play with one of these boards for a very long time, ever since it came out on Kickstarter and that's been a while already. And it's because of you guys, the subscribers, my viewers, I was able to reach out to this company and for them to send me out a review unit. So I want to thank you guys for watching and I also want to thank Udu for sending me out this unit. Now like I said, there's a couple of things that we're going to be talking about, which is one, this board. This board is pretty amazing. It's an x86 op, uh, system. That means I could install a full Windows 10 on here or Linux or quite possibly anything else on here that requires x86 instead of ARM devices that we've been playing with. This is also a single board computer with Arduino pinouts. So first it has four different models. The model we're going to be taking a look at is the Ultra, which is the highest model they sell. But they also have a Basic, Advanced, and Advanced Plus. For the project that we're going to be working on today, which is uh, turning this guy into a virtual machine server, I would recommend either getting the Advanced, Advanced Plus, or the Ultra. Now the Ultra uses a Pentium and it has eight gigs of RAM. Now judging by the look of this guy, it's pretty small. It's like the size of two Arduino boards, you could say, full size Arduino boards. Now on one side, you have the barrel connector. Then you have the USB 3, gigabit LAN, and three display stuff. One HDMI, two display ports. That's, that's pretty amazing, but I don't know why we would really need the three displays, but yeah, still pretty amazing. And you flip it to the other end, you're gonna notice on the left side, you have these speaker outputs. You have the headphone jack, two more USB 3s, and then you got this uh, little 7-pin uh, pinout for power, reset button, power LED, and stuff like that. And then you have the infrared and a little tiny switch over here, which really cool because the pinouts are really awesome. It almost turns this into a little computer. Like You could stick this in a case and it'll, you could actually wire this up to a case. Now, on the underside of this guy, this is where stuff gets interesting. You have the SD card. The ICSP, which is for the Arduino. You have the SATA. You could actually plug in SATA hard drives in this guy. And then you have two M.2 SATA ports with two different configurations. One is a 2230, and the other one is a 2260. Like I said, they're different pinouts. But what's cool about this, it supports M.2, which means it also supports PCIe lanes, which means you can ultimately put other hardware on here, like a graphic card or something like that. All in all, very cool stuff. Now, even though it has this beefy heatsink, I didn't really find the need to put a fan on it. I did, I didn't find the need to do it. I do like how it looks because you have all, on one side you have the USB 3 speakers and infrared and stuff like that. That you know is the front of the computer or the front of the SPC. While the back you have the power cord, network card and the display stuff in the back. So I like how they configured this so you could actually have two opposite sides. It could sit up somewhere, you could put it down and and you don't have plugs popping out from the side like any other stuff. Like Raspberry Pi, you have USB plugs over here and then you have some plugs on the side. That just doesn't make much sense to me. Why couldn't they just put it front and back? So today we're not really gonna be looking at the Arduino pinouts, but it's gonna be like any other board where you would have to communicate through a COM port just to communicate with these Arduino guys. Like I said in the beginning, we are gonna be installing a virtual machine server here and we are gonna be using Proxmox. I know you guys are gonna say, why not ESXi and all that stuff. The reason behind that is because Proxmox supports QEMU, which allows me to emulate different hardware chips. Like uh, the CPU, instead of having an Intel, I could be AMD or a Core 2 Dual or something like that, or ARM devices. So I could ultimately put any type of operating system on here, including Mac OS, because I could emulate that chipset. So that's why I'm going with Proxmox. You could buy this really cool acrylic case and you could buy a lot of attachments from their site for this, which is the fan itself. You could buy some M.2 SATAs. You could, like I said, the acrylic case. Really cool stuff that you could get for this guy. All in all, all this stuff will be linked in the description below to their website and where you could get this guy. So now let's get on to the virtual machine part. So first you would head over to uh, proxmox.com and download their latest version of their image. And then you could use Etcher to load it into a USB. Now the USB has to be one gigabyte or above. It doesn't really take much. Once you load through it, the first thing you gotta do is select uh, the hard drive. Now the hard drive itself, you could choose between the internal drive or if you got an M.2 SATA or even an actual SATA plugged in. And my recommendation is actually to install it into the internal drive if you want and then use the M.2 SATA or the um, external storage to be your actual images or your host for everything else. That way you don't have any clutter and if you remove the hard drive and swap it, 
you're not really losing anything. So I would do it that way. I didn't in this case because I actually have the internal storage for another project, but I'm lo loading everything into my M.2 SATA. Now make sure that you have all the network information correct, which is your IP address, gateway, and everything you need. Because as soon as you plug the network in, that's the port you're going to be using. And once that's all set, you just hit next to everything and let the install process go through. The next time you reboot it and you hook it up to a network, that is the IP we're going to be using to reach the system. All right, to start off to reach into this guy, remember the IP that I told you to install earlier? That's the IP that you are going to be using to reach to your Proxbox machine. And then you would have to add the port 8006. And also remember to do HTTPS. From here, we would have to use that. The username would be root and whatever password you set it earlier. Okay. Now that we're in, right now I actually have one Windows 10 system that I already installed in here, but let's go through the whole process. Now, you can actually see the summary of your system to see how many CPUs is being worked, how much RAM usage and storage and et cetera, et cetera. Now to load up your image, you would go over to local, go over to content, and then you would upload whatever images you have, Windows 10, Windows XP, whatever it is, you would upload the ISO image to here. Local LVM, that's where all your images take place. So I have one operating system here or one virtual machine, which is virtual machine 100, and that's the hard drive for it. And then over here, you can also tell what your storage space is. If you go over the summary, this is how much space you have for other operating systems. Now to create something brand new, you could just click up here, which is called the create VM, and type in the information. If you want to do something like Linux, okay? You would hit next, follow prompts. If you got an ISO image in there already, you can load up the ISO image. So you could go to OS, and then at this rate, you could do Linux. Uh, if it was a Linux operating system, you could do Linux 4.0, 4.x. Hard drive, you would probably change this over to SATA or IDE, and then give it the space that you want, which is 32 or whatever you need, 16 gigs, 32 gigs. I usually go around 32 gigs just for the default operating system. CPU is where you could actually give it an amount of cores. I would leave the socket at one, but you can give it two cores or three cores or whatever you need. Here's the thing, depending on what board you have for memory, you might want to only give it one gig of RAM, maybe two gigs of RAM or vice versa, right around that area. Now, if you got the Advanced or the Advanced Plus, that's somewhere around the point of one gig per operating system or maybe two if you're feeling lucky and you only want to have two operating systems. So keep in mind, you have four gigs of RAM on that thing, you might want to leave some RAM for the default host, and then the other you could divvy up between the two operating systems that you're going to load up. Now, I got the 8 gig model, so that means I could actually run up to maybe three operating systems giving two gigs of RAM each, or maybe one operating system could have three gigs of RAM, depending on how you want to play around with the memory. Now, you're not constantly using all three operating systems at a time, so the core count is really divvied up between the operating systems. So if you got one loaded up, and you're running Windows 10 and the other one is either on or off but it's idle, you're not really harming each other because that one's not really using much CPU usage. Now, once you hit next, you go to your network. Um, here, you, depending on the operating system, if you, you're using like Windows, I would do Intel E1000. If you're using Linux, you could do the virtual I.O. And then when you're done, you hit confirm, give it a couple of seconds, and you will have this brand new 101. You see this operating system right here. And at this rate, you could just hit the start button, go over to console, and it'll literally boot up your operating system and you would go through this screen like you were in front of your computer. So I'm not gonna go through this step, I'm just gonna shut it down right now, and I'll show you an operating system that is already done. I'm gonna stop this one, yes. So this guy's, um, this is my Windows 10 that I already have installed. And basically it runs just like any other desktop. Now, if you have the professional edition of Windows 10, you could actually RDP into it like it's a server. Uh, if not, you could always use it through this console mode or you could detach it like uh, it's a pop-up screen that you could detach and have it running elsewhere like this. So either way, you could uh, still work this operating system. I don't know, I keep explaining this, but there's so many uses for this. But like say you wanna learn how to use Kali, but you need a vulnerable Windows XP to test what you wanna test. You could spin up a Windows XP, spin up a Kali Linux, and learn how to break into your Windows XP. Now you're not destroying anything. The only thing it's gonna go into is your virtual machine system, so you're not harming anything. That's, that's the best part about this. Everything is all contained within this little board, and this little board is not that expensive, especially what you're trying to do with it. 
So thanks for watching this video. If you guys enjoyed it, please hit that like button. If you guys got any questions about it, hit it up in the comments below or check me out on my Facebook group because I've been doing a lot of chit chats over there. We have a huge community and everything over there. And if you are new to this channel, consider subscribing and hit that little bell notification icon so you know when the next video is going to be out. And as I say in my Nerd Cave, hack till it hurts.